Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it may be for you. Welcome to our next module, the uh, high-risk injuries or areas. For this mini-lecture, we're going to be talking about uh, the blood supply to bones, uh, some non-union, malunion issues, some easily missed fractures or difficult-to-see areas, and some tricks for that. Uh, also, uh, associated injuries, what you need to be thinking about when one thing happens, what the other injury might be, and uh, fracture complications. So, uh, blood supply to bones is a three-part system. Uh, the nutrient artery system, which is uh, high pressure, comes from the inside out, that's centrifugal, uh, that's more common in, uh, or it's more predominant in mature bone. The periosteal system, because it's low pressure, centripetal, comes from the outside in. And um, that's more prevalent for immature bone. And then finally, the metaphyseal epiphyseal system has a small part in the blood supply of the bones, uh, especially those around joints, but it comes from the periarticular vascular plexus. So there are a few bones in the body. Or there's, here's five here, um, but we do know there are others that have a bit of a tenuous blood supply. These are some of the more common ones, though, especially the scaphoid. We, we experienced that a good bit. Um, talus and femoral head as well. And then finally the odontoid and the base of the fifth metatarsal. So non-union is multifactorial, as with most things in medicine. Uh, poor blood supply due to me medical history is a problem. Also inadequate fracture stabilization, infection. Uh, fracture pattern can have a big um, say in this, and that's a, a segmental fracture. Uh, obviously it will disrupt the blood flow more than just a, a transverse fracture. And then finally, uh, poor blood supply due to the location, just as we talked about in the last slide. Malunion is a little different. Some people use those interchangeably, but they're really just they're a, a little different. Uh, malunion being not healed in anatomic position. Um, it's uh, short, uh, twisted, bent, uh, or involves the joint space. Any fracture that is poorly immobilized, whether that be with a splint or a cast, or with open reduction internal fixation, uh, can result in malunion. So some easily missed fractures, we need to think about the pretzel theory for this, uh, and that is that when you have a ring of bone, just like a, a pretzel ring, uh, you can't break that in just one place, you have to break it in two, uh, because of the, the rigid nature there, especially of, of adult bones. Now for pediatric bones it doesn't hold true, because they're more uh, malleable. So vertebrae, the rings of the vertebrae uh, obviously are, are one of those bony rings. The tibia and fibula and the radius and ulna also form a bony ring. Now they obviously do have ligamentous connections as well, so uh, you need to inspect closely for a fracture, uh, but in the end there may be a ligamentous disruption. So difficult to see on x-ray. Uh, Salter Harris type 1 and 5, uh, scaphoid, supracondylar fractures, calcaneus fractures, tibial plateau, hip, and vertebrae. Uh, all can be very difficult to see on x-ray. Uh, Salter Harris type 1, uh, x-ray and even CT may be normal for this, uh, but you really need to have a high index of suspicion. You're looking for tenderness over the physis, and you're going to treat that like a, like a fracture anytime you have tenderness there. Scaphoid often has a normal initial x-ray as well, uh, but ten any tenderness of the anatomic stuff box uh, should be treated as a fracture and immobilized spica splint. A supracondylar fracture uh, has a fat pad on the x-ray. There's a, a nice example there to the right of how those fat pads develop. Um, you can follow the anterior humeral line. That's a, an important one. It should uh, come down and, and hit the middle third of the capitellum. Uh, the concern for injury uh, to the uh, median or ulnar uh, nerve uh, may indicate a fracture as well and, and then if you have a fracture you need to be checking those as well and then this should prompt uh, immediate orthopedic consultation. So calcaneus fractures is easily missed just because the calcaneus uh, many times overlaps with other bones uh, on the x-rays especially the AP and such. So uh, on a lateral x-ray, we use something called a bowler's angle to help us look for a cult fracture. So, to draw a bowler's angle, you take the most cephalic point on the tuberosity to the highest point of the posterior facet, and that's line 1. For line 2, you take the highest point of the posterior facet to the most cephalic part of the uh, posterior process, and that forms line 2. 
So now, the angle that's found here with the asterisk is the one that we're looking at, and uh, normal is 20 to 40, and a uh, comparison x-ray may be helpful for this. And then if it's decreased, that indicates that there likely is a fracture, or could be a fracture. And uh, the lower the number, the worse the prognosis, and even less than zero obviously is much worse prognosis. So calcaneus fractures are also associated with uh, talus injuries. Um, so a CT scan is often needed for this to rule out talus injuries. Mechanism many times will be a fall from a height and likely will need other imaging such as uh, imaging of the spine for, for stuff like that. Uh, you want to mobilize this with an AO splint. You want to use plaster for that so that the strong muscles of the lower leg don't break through your fiberglass splits. We go ahead and just use plaster, 15 sheets um, for both the stirrup portion as well as the posterior to get this immobilized. So these four at the end, the calcaneus, tibial plateau, hip, and vertebrae, we often use CT scan to investigate those better. The first three, we don't use CT as often in the emergency department. Many times we just treat them as if they're there. Um, and especially with like a supracondylar, you know, there's not as much overlying bone there, so we rely more on our x-ray findings. Uh, but those last four we definitely typically turn to a CT scan sooner. Associated injuries, you know, knee dislocation has a high association with popliteal artery injury. Obviously this is not a patellar dislocation, which is a different thing, a much less serious injury. Um, and then the scapular fractures have a high association with first and second rib fractures. And of course the major vessels run right through there, uh, so that is uh, an issue could result in uh, a vascular injury as well, whether it be a vein or artery, it really doesn't matter in that area, they're both pretty huge. So uh, fracture complications, you can talk about uh, vascular injuries, nerve injury, uh, fat emboli syndrome, DVTs, and compartment syndrome. We'll spend the most time on this on compartment syndrome. So classic signs of vascular injury, pain, pallor, pulselessness, or just decreased pulse, uh, paresthesias, and paralysis. Obviously, pulselessness is a very late finding in all these. Uh, nerve injuries are more common than vascular injuries. The result from uh, blunt or penetrating trauma can be both direct or indirect. And then uh, a nerve is at increased risk of injury if it's in a superficial location, if it's close to the bone, or spans a joint. Some associations here, so for the elbow we're looking at the median or ulnar uh, nerve, the shoulder dislocation we can get concerned about the axillary nerve, sacral is called equina, uh, acetabulum is sciatic, uh, hip dislocation is the femoral nerve, uh, femoral shaft fracture is the peroneal nerve, or peroneal nerve, um, knee dislocation, tibial or the peroneal, and then uh, lateral tibial plateau is the peroneal as well. Fat emboli syndrome is the most common form of non-thrombotic embolism. 20% of pelvic or long bone fractures um, are a result of this, or I'm sorry, result in this, uh, with detectable fat droplets in the patient's blood. There's a characteristic clinical course. Uh, there's typically an asymptomatic period of 12 to 36 hours after the fracture, so many times we won't see this in the emergency department unless they're coming back uh, later after they've been discharged. Signs and symptoms, you have cardiopulmonary and neurologic deterioration. Uh, it comes on as hypoxia, tachypnea, and tachycardia. It may progress fully to um, DIC or ARDS. And then finally, the mental status changes with agitation, hallucinations, delirium, and coma. So for DVT, our physical exam is not reliable to rule out DVT. We'll say that one again physical exam is not reliable to rule out DVT. That home and sign that we like to use is useless. So we need to maintain a high index of suspicion yet again for this. Uh, our work obviously, uh, if there's a cast or a splint on there, we definitely need to take that off. We need to look and see what's going on. Um, and then we need to do a, a duplex ultrasound. Treatment, Lovenox, Warfarin, some of the newer anticoagulants are, are making a push into this market. Um, so you may see those out there as well. So, uh, compartment syndrome, we have our pressure cooker here. So, um, you know, as the uh, pressure inside the compartment builds up, it overcomes the 
venous pressure. When the venous pressure is overcome, the veins collapse. When the veins collapse, they can no longer drain the blood. And when they can no longer drain the blood, it continues to fill up with arterial blood uh, up until it overcomes the arterial pressure. And then at that point, the compartment becomes closed off completely. Uh, this obviously is a, uh, an emergency. It's a true orthopedic emergency. Um, there are some other specialties that may handle this at different hospitals. General surgery may handle something like this at a small hospital. Um, but there are factors that increase the uh, compartmental content, such as bleeding, swelling, or fluid extravasation. You know, there are external factors as well, like casts or splints or occlusive dressings or a burn with an SR. Um, but it typically follows a very predictable pattern, and that is that the pain you know, kind of gradually increases until it gets to a point and then it actually goes up quite sharply and um, you know there, there's risks obviously with uh, any time they have uh, on a, or on a, any anticoagulants so the uh, severe pain uh, many times out of proportion to physical exam findings is a hallmark of this plus minus on hypoesthesia and if you're waiting for pulselessness, you will be waiting way too long. So pulselessness is a very late finding in this. And there are some compartments uh, through which no artery runs. So if you think about that, you know, if the artery that's going to the distal portion or the part past the, uh, the compartment, so say we're talking about a lower leg compartment, if there's no artery running through that compartment to get to the foot, for example, then you're never going to have pulselessness. So to wait on that would be erroneous. Um, and the intracompartmental pressure should be measured once the issue of compartment syndrome is raised or the patient should be taken for emergent fasciotomy. There are some common sites. Uh, volar compartment of the forearm, the anterior compartment of the leg, and there's an often missed site in the, in the posterior compartment of the leg, especially the posterior deep. It is not necessarily associated with a fracture. You can just have muscle strain with warfarin use or other anticoagulants that precipitates compartment syndrome. So here at WVU, a lot of times, you know, we call for compartment syndrome testing. Um, we have a hard time getting the striker device, the orthopedist, uh, kind of closely guard that device. And, um, you know, they, they come on down and, and they push on the leg and, and then leave and say it's not a compartment syndrome. Um, they'll tell you that they're, you know, obviously they're they're taking a history and everything too. And I don't doubt that. Um, talking to the patient and trying to uh, figure this out, um, but you know the, the clinical exam can be unreliable, despite uh, what some may tell you. In uh, 2010, an article in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery of America, uh, which is a major journal for orthopedics. Uh, the title being Physicians' Ability to Manually Detect Isolated Elevations in Leg Intracompartmental Pressure. It wasn't just physicians, actually. It was the orthopedic attendings and residents who took part in this study. Um, they pushed on fresh cadaver lower legs uh, where uh, the four compartments, uh, one of them, the pressure has been, had been raised uh, to 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury, which obviously is abnormal, uh, while the other three were in a more normal range. And then they were asked a few questions. They were asked to decide if there was compartment syndrome, and then if there was, what compartment they thought it was in. Uh, and then finally, how would they describe their findings, and also whether they would be taking the patient to, for emergent fasciotomy. So, um, if they, if, when the endpoint was used as correctly identifying compartment syndrome, as well as complex, I'm sorry, correctly identifying the compartment with the elevated pressure, so that's a pretty difficult endpoint. Um, the sensitivity is only 24%, so not that good, obviously, We're not catching all of those. And specificity was 55%, positive value and negative, you can see there. Uh, you know, that if they change, when they change the endpoint to, you know, really it, it may not matter, because if they go in and start, you know, doing a fasciotomy, they typically will release all the compartments just to allow uh, for some swelling, or at least a couple of the compartments. Or they may just start releasing compartments until they find the one where the pressure is increased. Um, so they changed their endpoint and said, okay, well, let's make it a little easier on our, on our uh, participants. And let's say, okay, if it's correctly recommend fasciotomy, despite an inability to localize the compartment, sensitivity went up to 54%, so uh, a little more than doubled. But when you look at that, we're still missing half the cases, right? So that's, that's still a big problem. Um, specificity, 76%, and then positive predictive value jumped way up to 70%, as well as uh, negative predictive value actually stayed the same. 
So uh, the final conclusion of the study uh, in long text said manual detection of compartment firmness associated with critical elevations in intercompartmental pressure is poor. So manual detection is poor. And then who do we have to thank for this study but just our good friends here at Western University, Dr. Schuler, who's since moved on, and Dr. Dietz, who was a resident at the time, who uh, graduated and came back after doing his uh, joint replacement fellowship. So uh, a couple of our own um, orthopedists who uh, did this study. It was an excellent study, and we thank them for that. So a striker device, there's, an, there's a link there, and it offers a good video. A um, couple issues with the video. Um, when you're zeroing the device, you really want it to be at the same angle and preferably flat you know, or horizontal or parallel with the ground or however you want to say that um, when you're zeroing it. The other thing, when you um, push on that syringe, there's some saline in that syringe connected to that circular part that is the interface with the uh, machine, and then there's a big needle sticking out the end of it. When you push the fluid out, you want to push the fluid out first to zero it to get it um, make sure that it's calibrated and then when you're in the compartment and you push some fluid out you really want to push very very little fluid out that syringe you really only want a few drops to be coming out that needle uh, because if you push a bunch out into the compartment you actually will falsely elevate your pressure there and it'll take a long time for that to come back down so there's that link there we're going to put that up in a separate document as well uh, so you can actually just click on it if you like or you can just copy it down so normal pressures, uh, you know, somewhere up to 30, 40 ish, if that. Um, but anything over that uh, should uh, have a high concern for compartment syndrome. And also, if it gets within uh, 30 millimeters of mercury of the mean arterial pressure, that's also an issue. Um, it's a very delicate tool; uh, it can be difficult to work. So um, watch that video, and, and uh, hopefully, we'll get you a chance to practice with it sometime. So treatment of this is obviously a fasciotomy, uh, but up until that point, because that can be difficult to mobilize that, um, you maintain a normal tensive blood pressure, uh, elevate the extremity to the heart level, and then uh, emergency fasciotomy, emergency fasciotomy timing is crucial. If it's greater than 12 hours, a significant muscle and nerve damage is likely. So if you're at a, a small out, outlying hospital in Wyoming or somewhere uh, where you don't have access to care, this could be a procedure that you, know, you would perform in the emergency department. Um, it's not a, a particularly difficult procedure. It's going to involve kind of dousing the leg with betadine and, and cutting down to get into muscle belly or through the fascia so that you can just allow that pressure to release and get that blood out of there. So a recap of our high-risk areas or injuries. Um, we know that there are some areas of tenuous blood supply in the body. We need to be cognizant of that and uh, especially looking at those for fractures. We know that poor immobilization leads to malunion. Um, that's on us. We need to be uh, diligent about that, or at least assure a close follow-up. Uh, CT or close follow-up for a cult fracture may be needed. Um, that's used more for some injuries than others. Uh, we look for a, uh, associated injuries such as nerves, veins, or arteries. Uh, and then finally, compartment pressures. Uh, compartments cannot be assessed by palpation alone. Again, compartments cannot be assessed by palpation alone. All right. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.